Well, let's take our Bibles this evening to Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to say several more things uh, tonight regarding Resurrection Sunday and Easter Sunday. This morning, I mentioned we worship the Lord for two primary purposes. We worship the Lord for who he is and for what he has done. Now, tonight, this morning, I mentioned spent most of our time on who Jesus is, uh, showing us from John's gospel primarily that Jesus is God. Tonight, we're going to talk about why did Jesus have to die? So historically, if you think back 2,000 years, a little over now, uh, this past Sunday was Palm Sunday, what we refer to as Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey. Then we come up to today, and this is Resurrection Sunday, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, for Christianity, this past week, historically speaking, is the, is the most glorious week, and yet at the very same time, one of the saddest weeks you could possibly imagine in the life of Christianity. There are three days that stand out above all the other days during Passion Week. That's what we refer to the week between the, the uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the crucifixion, and that would be this. Palm Sunday is the first day when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. The second day would be crucifixion day, when Jesus was crucified on the cross. And the third day that stands out would be Resurrection Sunday when up from the grave he arose and Jesus rose from the dead. In Matthew chapter 27, and I am going to read several verses out of this passage. Uh, We're not going to read the whole chapter. It's a long chapter, but I'll be honest with you. We're, We're going to read more than half of it, all right? So I'm going to start, let me pray. And then uh, I'm again, and then I'm going to start in Matthew 27, verse 1. Now, Lord, as we look at these times historically in the life of our Savior, it really is kind of moving emotionally uh, to see everything that Jesus did for us. It moves our hearts, stirs our souls, and Lord kind of saddens us at the same time, but yet it's so glorious to know that because Jesus rose, we till we too will uh, rise again. And so it's kind of a bittersweet thing, but the sweet out where uh, for us is so sweet, it's unimaginable. So we thank you. And now I pray that as we look at this text of scripture from Matthew 27, that you would empower me, that you would uh, anoint the message and anoint my lips and speak to all of our hearts here this evening as we think about and ponder what our Savior did for us, especially as we get prepared to take communion together. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things about a communion service, it's really a memorial. We do this in remembrance of him. So let's follow a little bit of the the, uh, sequence of events that happened. Look at Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2. When the morning was come, and all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So Jesus is taken to Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin and all of that there. Then you'll skip all the way down. So now he's arrested. His trial is getting going. You'll look at verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, He answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witnessed against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. So here is Jesus. He is before Pilate, but he really isn't defending himself. He's just there and uh, knowing what's coming. Now let me read a little bit lengthier passage beginning in verse 15. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had taken a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called the Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Pilate knew Jesus really wasn't guilty of anything, and that they had delivered him to Pilate out of envy. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him a saying, Have nothing to do with that just man. Even as Pilate's wife knew Jesus was a just man. 
For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will that ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with the Jesus which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. The governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could uh, prevail nothing, but that rather atonement was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. So he even recognized that Jesus was a just man. Then, verse 25, then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, that is, he was whipped with the whip, the cat of nine tails, he delivered him to be crucified. So Pilate, in that, those particular verses, struggles to release either Jesus or Barabbas. His wife says, you have nothing to do with that just man. He made his decision, though, to have Jesus crucified and to release Barabbas, who was a criminal, based on the peer pressure of the people. And that's a sad way to make your decision, but that's the way he made his decision. Then if you'll notice in verses 27 and 28, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus unto the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and they put on him a scarlet robe. Now that really is the soldiers that are there. They are mocking the Savior. Now a little further, verse 29. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit upon him. They took the reed and smote him on the head. Now let me pause for just a second. Remember what was on his head? A crown of thorns. I don't know what the thorns were made out of, but there was some kind of a crown of thorns. And so when they took that reed and they smote him on the head, and that, that would actually drive those thorns right into his head. Verse 31, and after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put on his own remnant on him and led him away to crucify him. As they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. When they were coming to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots. That's kind of sad. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set over his head, uh, his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then were two thieves crucified him, with him one on the right hand and the other on the left. And so the soldiers are mocking him. We then read of the crucifixion scene, verse 39 and following. Uh, <clears throat> let me read that verse. And they passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads. We find the, the just people mocking Jesus as he's hanging there on the cross of Calvary. And uh, let me read several verses here as well, saying, Thou that destroyedest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were cru crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now, I want you to watch closely. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all of the land unto the ninth hour. So for three hours, it's just pitch black. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, and I won't try to, but it means at the end of the verse, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is right there in those three hours, that is when the Father is turning his back on the Son. That is when Jesus is becoming the sin bearer. When Paul said, he who knew no sin became sin for us.
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And right here at that point is exactly when the sins of the world, my sins and your sins and everybody's sins in the world, that's when they're laid on Jesus, right then. And so the father is a purer eyes than a look on iniquity, Habakkuk said. And so the father turns his back and Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You've never known forsakenness, loneliness like that. And you never will. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called for Elias. Straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink. The rest said, let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And then you have this, the rest of this scene. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. I don't know that I'll get back to it tonight. So you see those, those words, yielded up the ghost. We read this morning where nobody took his life. He laid it down. They didn't kill Jesus. He gave up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Now, I will come back to that. That is very important. From the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, and among which was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Now for years... The Jews had traveled to Jerusalem for, we said Passion Week, but it's Passover week. And so for years, the Jews had traveled to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. But this particular year in history was, in that sense, no different than any other year. Jews would gather together. They would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Yet it would turn out to be one of the most significant days and probably the single most significant week in the entire history of the world. They were coming to Jerusalem. They were coming to sacrifice lambs. And how many, you ever wonder how many years this had gone on and how many caravans of people and how many sacrifices and how many bloody carcasses and how many lambs were slain, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. But this year, things are different and about radically the change because this year... God himself is on the cross. The creator of the universe is being executed in Jerusalem. Spit on, blood and, uh, spit and blood are caked to his cheeks. His lips are cracked and swollen. Thorns rip through his scalp. His lungs burn with tames. His legs are cramping from trying to lift himself up on the cross as he tries to get air so that he can breathe. This is no normal Passover. This isn't like any of the Passovers that had happened all the years before that. His heart is breaking. His own countrymen clamor at his death. One of his own disciples is the one that planted the kiss of betrayal, Judas Iscariot. His friends ran for cover. And now his own father is beginning to turn his back on him, leaving him alone, causing him to cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Someone says, Jesus, do you give no thought to saving yourself? What keeps you here? What holds you to that cross? Nails could never hold God to a tree. So what makes you stay? This day, things were like never before. I want you to notice again in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. From the sixth hour unto the ninth hour. So what hour is that our time? That is from noon to three o'clock in the afternoon. We have a different clock than they had, okay? So that's the times, and there was darkness over the face of the earth, now, uh, over the, that area there. Now, can you imagine? At noon, it turns dark. You've never seen that. Nobody's ever seen that. But that's what happened. And for the next three hours, that's the way that it was, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. So Mark, in chapter 15 and verse 25, indicated that Jesus had been placed on the cross at the third hour, or 9 o'clock in the morning. So actually, Jesus was on the cross for six hours total. But the last three hours, there was darkness 
over that area in Jerusalem. And that's what happened. So now at noon, there's darkness, supernatural darkness, like never before. There are six hours right here that have changed the history and the eternal destiny of mankind forever. During this time, the darkness of God's wrath is poured out upon his own son. He took our sins and the sins of the world, and he took them upon himself. So I asked this question a moment ago. What kept him there? Love kept him there. Love for sinners kept him there. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. What kept Jesus on the cross? Now think about this personally. His love for me. His love for you and you and you and you and you. His love for everybody kept Jesus on the cross. That's what kept him there. Verse 46, he cried out, my God, my God. Here we have the high cost of the atonement for our sins as Jesus became our sin bearer. The sins of the world and my sin and your sin, every one of us, sins placed upon him. Not only was there darkness, look there again at verse 50, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And then I want you to notice the second thing. <clears throat> there was darkness, and then in verse 51 it says this. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And then it also said the earth did quake and the rocks rent. The veil was torn in half. Now this particular veil here, this is not just any curtain. This isn't like, you know, a curtain in your house I'm hanging down somewhere, man. This is the curtain that was in the, the tabernacle, in, or in the temple, I guess is a probably pro proper way to say it. And you've got the holy place, and then there's a curtain that divides it, and behind that curtain is the most holy place. And one time, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go back behind that second curtain and make an atonement for the sins of the people. But on this particular Passover, it says the temple veil was rent from top to the bottom. Now, what does that mean? That means every single person now has access to God themselves. There's going to be no more sacrifice after this sacrifice. There will be no more priesthood after this sacrifice. Jesus is our great high priest, and he shall ever be. And so this... this Tearing of the temple, uh, 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 of the veil rather, is a big deal. The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, and now the Holy of Holies is open for everybody. Now the significance of that cannot be overstated because it symbolized the permanent opening of God's presence to man and also man's direct access to God through the work of Jesus Christ. No more sacrifices necessary. This is it. After this day, there'll be no more lambs sacrificed because John the Baptist said, Jesus is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Nor do we go to a priest any longer because we have our great high priest. You, me, whoever, we can go directly to God, right directly to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these six hours are, six, are the six most important hours in history. And the scene is like no scene before. The sky is black, the veil tears, there is a scream, soldier pierces the side of the Savior, and holy blood from the Lamb of God comes forth and it cleanses sin. And then there's an earthquake. And uh, when those who were there witnessed this, Verse 54 says, Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Six hours like never before, and six hours like never again. Never again. May I ask you a question? What do you do with that day in history? What does that day mean to you? that day that they took Jesus and nailed him to the cross, those six hours that he was there, those last three particularly when the sins of our, the world were laid upon our Savior, what does that mean to you? If it really happened, if God did indeed plan his own crucifixion, if he did, did turn his back on his own son, if indeed he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, then those six hours that day were packed with, listen, tragic triumph. Earlier I said bitter, 
sweet. That's what they are. It was God on that cross. The hill that we call Calvary, the place of the skull, is a place that in six hours are some of the most critical hours, if not the most critical hours in the history of the world. Now why? Why did this have to happen? Why did it have to happen like this? I'd like to consider why it was necessary for Christ to die on Calvary's cross. Jesus himself speaks of his death as of a necessity. Take your Bible there and turn over to John chapter 3. <clears throat> Verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even, watch the next three words, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him, him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus must be lifted up. There was no other option. He had to do that. He was pre Jesus was prepared a body to be a priestly sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 teaches us that. And there was no other way. So why is the cross necessary? Number one, and you can follow your outline if you want to in your bulletin. First of all, the holiness of God demanded it. I quoted this verse earlier, but Habakkuk 1.13 says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. The world was full of sin. And all of these sacrifices that had happened year after year after year only made atonement for sin or a covering for sin, but they never really washed the sin away. Somebody had to make a sacrifice to wash our sin away. And that somebody was the Lord Jesus Christ. God's holiness demands that sin be punished. Some people think sin is okay. All the ceremonial cleansing sacrifices of the Mosaic law shows the moral distance between a sinful man and a holy God. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, remission of sin. And so God's holiness demands that sin be punished. And if people do not accept what Jesus did on that cross, they have to pay their own sin debt, right? And when they pay their own sin debt, they pay their own sin debt for all of eternity, separated from God. What a sad thing. This, what a sad way to spend eternity, separated from God and in hell. Awful, awful thing. But that's, that's what happens. Now, God chose the costliest means for our deliverance by sending his own son, the Lord Jesus we may be sure that nothing short of him could have purchased our redemption and satisfied the just demands of God, as Isaiah said. So first of all, the holiness of God or the just demands of God demanded it. Secondly, the love of God made it necessary. I want to say it was Adrian Rogers, but somebody said something like this. God loves you enough to send his son, and God will accept you just the way you are but God loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. God loves us. Now, I want you to look at 1 John chapter 4. Hold your finger there in John chapter 3 or 4, whatever chapter you're in. 1 <clears throat> John chapter 4 in verse 10. It says this. I'll wait for you to get there. 1 John 4, 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Have you ever heard anybody give a testimony and say, oh, I've always loved God? That really isn't true. In fact, if you go to Paul's epistles in the first chapter of Ephesians or the second chapter, one or the other, it talks about he were, we were aliens with God and enemies of God. It's, but here's what happens. God, what did it say? Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And how does he show that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins? And then flip back. I told you, keep your finger there. John 3, 16. It said, for God so loved. And that little word so indicates the intensity of God's love for us. God so loved me. God so loved you and you and you. God so loved us. His love was so intense, its presence so great, 
that of, it of necessity burst the bonds, Bancroft said, it burst the bonds of the Godhead, poured itself in lavish fullness upon a lost and ruined race. And it did. God's holiness made it necessary. God's love made it necessary. Thirdly, the sin of man made it necessary. Peter wrote, For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. It was the lost, strayed condition as sheep going astray. It was the lost, strayed condition of humanity that made necessary the death of Jesus Christ. It wasn't plan B. There was no plan B. This was it. Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save sinners. He came to seek and to save those just like me, sinful, just like you, sinful. He came to seek and to save us. This is the magnet that drew Christ from heaven. He could not be satisfied with the glory which he had with the Father before the world was, while man remained estranged from God in what the Bible calls a lost condition. We need to see sin as the Bible describes it, as something that brings wrath and punishment as a crime that deserves punishment. And when we see sin as God sees it, we also see the great need that we have for a Savior an atoning, a redeeming Savior in the blood of his cross is the only thing that can cure us of our sin. So the sin of mankind made it necessary. And then if you'll go to Luke chapter 24, <clears throat> the fulfillment of Scripture made it necessary. Now I said this was not an accident, okay? In Luke chapter 24 and verse 25, This might not even be the right reference I want. <clears throat> then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Shouldn't he suffer these things? You say, well, yeah, I guess he should. have. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, I wrote in here verse 45, but I want to see if I wrote it for this message. Well, then it says, Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And so, Jesus, this, to fulfill the Scriptures, this was necessary. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, how that he died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. It had to be done to fulfill the Scriptures. And then if you would please look at Acts chapter 2. In verse 23, the purpose of God made it necessary. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, not just the foreknowledge of God, but also the determinate counsel. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You see, God's eternal plan and purposes include the redemption of man from a lost condition to bring bad or to, to buy man back to himself, and the only plan that will work is the cross. That's the only plan. Since there was none other good enough to pay the price of sin, God's plan for, was for Jesus to be the substitute for sinners. The word redemption means to buy back. And God bought us back. Jesus paid the cost, a cost. The death and the blood of Jesus Christ paid the cost for my sin. And lost, that is the condition of mankind before salvation. Do you know at one time all of us have been lost? We've all been lost. Oh, there's, there's not one person that hasn't been lost. But it was the love of God that caused all of this to happen. So Jesus Christ did not die accidentally. He did not die as a martyr. This was an act of love. A just and holy God demanded it. It was God's saving work on behalf of mankind, and it was necessary. Now, I want to make a few more comments just quickly uh, when I think about our Lord's death. Um, your, and your outline, it's A, but I'm just going to say one, two, three. Number, first of all, 
It was predetermined. It wasn't an accident. I've stressed that on purpose. Where we read in Matthew's gospel, it says all was predetermined by God. We read that earlier. Acts said him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Revelation says he is a lamb slain from the foundations of the world. It was going to happen. The atoning work of Christ had its origin in eternity. Its source was in God. Secondly, it was voluntary. Now, I read some of this this morning, but in John chapter 10 and verse 17 and 18, I didn't read verse 18, but I did read 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, verse 17, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And this commandment I have received of my Father. Jesus voluntarily gave himself for the sins of the world. He had power to lay it down, and he had power to take it up. F.E. Marsh said there was no compulsion laid upon him, other than, that, than the impulsion of his own heart of love. Love compels by its impelling. So it was voluntary. And then it was vicarious. And I said, well, that's a weird word. What's the word vicarious mean? It means it was on the behalf of other people. Jesus didn't die for other, uh, himself. He died for others. Peter said, for Christ also was once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So it was for the sake of others. Paul said Christ died for our sins. He didn't say Jesus died for his sins. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then it was sacrificial. And that is to say it was an offering for sin. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that it might be a new lump, as ye are unleavened for Christ. Listen, it says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Do you remember the story in Exodus about the Passover? When God told uh, Moses on the 10th plague, the 10th judgment upon Egypt, he's going to say, you're, I'm gonna, you're gonna, this is how the children of Israel are going to come out. There's going to be the death of the firstborn, but we don't want any of the firstborn to die, so you, you, you take a lamb, you kill the lamb, and you take the blood, you put it in a basin, and you take a brush, and you put it up the sides of the door and over the top of the door, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so we sing the song, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Well, that's where it comes from. Jesus was our Passover lamb. That is, he died and he shed his blood for you and I. That is, he tasted death for every man. He was our Passover. So it was his sacrifice, or I said it was sacrificially. Fifthly, it was redemptive. Then the Bible says in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sins. So what does it mean to say it was redemptive. Well, let me give a simple illustration. When you walk into a grocery store or some other store, you buy something, you purchase something, and you walk up and you have to make a what? A payment. You know what it means? Jesus paid our sin debt. And he didn't leave any of it unpaid. He paid it all. He paid every single bit of it. It was the payment God demanded for sin. So his death was redemptive. And then sixthly, it was substitutionary. And that simply is this. It was in place of others. Jesus didn't die for himself. He died for us. We owed it. I said this this morning. We owed a debt we could not pay, but he paid a debt he did not owe. And we ought to be grateful for that. So let me ask you something. What do those six hours that Jesus spent on the cross, what do they mean to you? You kind of just, eh, blow them off. I'm a Christian now, it's all good, I don't worry about it. You ever think about them? You ever made it, meditate about them and just pause and take a look? I hope you have today. I hope you have over this past week, to really, to be honest. To have thought about what Jesus went through for us. If you have never accepted his work on the cross as full, complete, and absolute payment for your sin, you really need to do that. There is no other person, no other way 
to have your sin forgiven except through Jesus. No other way. Stop trying to save yourself. You can't save yourself. You couldn't pay your sin debt on this earth if you wanted to. It could never happen. No matter what you do, you just trust Christ and his work. So if you're here tonight and you've never received Christ as your Savior, I'm going to encourage you to do that here in just a moment. But if you are saved, and that is the majority of you, I'm sure, <clears throat> you need to rejoice, you need to remember, and you need to celebrate. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday because Jesus rose from the grave, and in doing so, we are victorious as he was victorious. And then in a moment, we're going to remember. We're going to remember what Jesus did for us. I hope I've actually painted a little bit of picture for you that already. Anyway, Faith, if you'd slip up here to the piano, please. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around. When we prepare to take communion together, the, you have to know Jesus as your Savior. Though I did say this just a couple of minutes ago, actually. If you would admit to God that you are a sinner, lift your heart to him in prayer and ask him to forgive you of your sin, confess the idea that you are a sinner, and ask Jesus to be your Savior and receive him into your life to save you, he will do that for you right now, wherever you're sitting. If you have never done that, <clears throat> I would ask you to, to not partake of the communion service with us because communion is for believers, those that have put their faith in Jesus. The second thing I would say, if you are a believer and you plan on participating in communion, you need to make sure your heart is right with God. There is no known habitual sin in your life, and if there is, you need to confess it, repent of it, and forsake it this evening. Uh, you need to deal with your own heart. You need to examine yourself, as Paul told us in 1 Corinthians. So you'll be able to have time here in just a moment to do that. But there's two things there that have to happen before we can celebrate communion together. So Faith is going to play for a few minutes here. And we're going to take time and meditate on this. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. If you need to trust Jesus, trust Jesus. If you need to get some things right with God so you can partake of the communion service, take time to do so.
Now, these are COVID-style communion things, okay? And the, so the, the wafer on the top and the, what we drink for, to represent the blood <clears throat> is underneath it. So these guys are going to pass these out, and uh, but wait for everybody so that we can participate together. Don't just grab it and tear it open, all right? Well, you can tear it open and get ready, but don't, don't eat anything or drink anything yet. The Bible says, and when he had given, th let me go back a verse. It says, for I have received of the Lord that which, oh I, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, so it's the same night that Judas betrayed him, took bread, and when he had given thanks. So these guys are going to pass this out, and I want you to wait till we all have it, and faith is going to play more, and we'll have some meditation time, and, uh, and then we'll ask God to give, we'll give the Lord thanks for his broken body. All right, so if you'll tarry till they're done. All right, go ahead, guys. opening this than these guys are. <laughs> anyway, so is anybody having trouble opening that? Good. Well, we're all thumbs up here. I guess that's the problem. Get, yeah, get a different one. I didn't have very good opener open in mine either. We're going to have to have a real supper if you don't hurry up. <laughs> To a girl, maybe she can get longer fingernails. Anyway, so the Bible says, and when he had given thanks, he break it, the bread, and he said, "Take, eat." This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So I said a moment ago, it's a remembrance. Lord, give thanks as we remember the broken body of our Lord.
Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. You can go ahead. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye redrink it in remembrance of me. And so now we give thanks as we remember the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. For your word tells us about the blood that is in the word. That's right. Amen. And we willingly went to your cross and shed your blood to pay our sin for that blood. Lord, we just can't obtain this past without your blood. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness to us. Lord, we we praise you for all that you've done for us. Lord, that's what we pray. That is your will. God help us. Amen. Go ahead. <clears throat> now there are some, there's a trash can when you leave just, Brother Bill's going to get it, but uh, make sure you put your trash in the trash can. Okay, normally we have a cup holder in the pew, but we don't have that here. All right, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Thank you for being here throughout the day. It was a great day. I thank you for it. Thank the Lord for it. Our Heavenly Father, we come into you, presence, the last time tonight, and we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your salvation, for your shed blood, for your death on the cross. We thank you for your resurrection, your ascension into heaven. We thank you for your high priestly ministry. We thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit who now indwells us and guides us and leads us and directs us. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And we thank you for who our Savior is. He is our God and he is our King and he is our Savior. And we thank you and we praise you. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.